Generally speaking, the 1970s are considered to be the decade when video games properly started to happen. However, it's a scarily interesting fact that the seeds of gaming were sown more than two decades earlier. Much as we human beings scarcely resemble our primordial ancestors, in its first 15 or so years, gaming was barely recognisable from its modern equivalent. And yet, without the things that happened in those years, the things that happen now wouldn't also be happening. Things. Incredibly, the games created between 1947 and 1959 featured many of the hallmarks of the sort of games we're still playing today. I mean, seriously, get a load of this shit. It seems depressingly appropriate that the first ever interactive electronic game would take its inspiration from war. However, coming just two years after the end of World War II, it's hardly a surprise either. One of its creators, Thomas T. Goldsmith Jr., was a radar operator. The snappily named cathode ray amusement device comprised of a cathode ray tube hooked up to an oscilloscope, whatever that is. A set of knobs and switches allowed players to fire artillery shells at targets such as tanks and planes, represented using plastic screen overlays, Vectrex style. The Goldfish Jr. and his colleague Essel, Ethel, Estel, Estley, Estley, Rayman, no, really, the first computer game was created by Rayman, applied for a patent, though the cathode ray amusement device was never released commercially. Boo hoo! Bernie the Brain sounds like a CBB show, but he, it, was also one of the first proper computer games. Developed for the Canadian National Exhibition, the giant computer allowed visitors to play a game of noughts and crosses. Seen ultimately as more of a novelty than a signpost to the future of computing, Birdie was disassembled following the exhibition and never seen again. Though not technically a video game, Birdie's display used light bulbs rather than a video screen. It was designed by Dr. Joseph Cates, who later went on to create the first traffic signalling system, possibly earning him the nickname The Bulb Father. Debuting at the 1951 Festival of Britain, Nimrod allowed attendees to play the boring ancient mathematical strategy game Nim against a faster than thought electronic brain. Among those who played on Nimrod was Enigma code breaker Alan Turing. That is to say, the code breaker Alan Turing who broke the Nazis' Enigma code, not that Alan Turing was a code breaker who was also an Enigma, although he also was an Enigma. British computer scientist Christopher Strachey, or however you're supposed to say it, created a drafts program for the pilot ACE computer, which was in fact designed by the aforementioned Alan Turing. The program was so advanced that it utilised all of the computer's available memory, being able to play a complete game of drafts at a reasonable speed. Strachey also wrote one of the first computer music programs, instructing the Ferranti Mark I to perform Bar Bar Black Sheep, God Save the King, and Glenn Miller's In the Mood. In the mood for what though, Glenn? Oh, hello. There's a joke in here somewhere about Oxo being the predecessor of the GameCube. You know, Oxo Cube, GameCube joke. Ah. Oxo was another noughts and crosses program, and yes, it also displayed its visuals on, that's right, an oscilloscope. Sadly, not available to be played by the grubby 1950s public, Oxo was only open to visitors to the University of Cambridge's Mathematical Laboratory, which sounds like the most boring place on earth. Engineers at the University of Michigan managed to create a working pool simulator through their MidSAC computer, which featured on-screen representations of the table balls in queue. As the players took their shots, the computer calculated the movement of the balls in real time. And indeed, if any of us were blessed with a MidSAC ball, I suspect we'd also need a computer to calculate its movements. Hutzpiel was invented at the John Hopkins University in Baltimore for the US government. A Cold War-inspired war game, it pitted two players against one another as opposing nuclear states. The NATO-esque OTAN and the thinly veiled USSR stand-in the URSS focused on a fictional confrontation along the banks of the Rhine. And like more recent commercial strategy games, required players to balance ammunition and fuel supplies. The university later created a similar naval warfare simulator and a more advanced version of Hutspiel entitled Theaterspiel. Pong is considered the first proper video game, even if most people forget that it was a proven rip-off. In fact, Pong wasn't even the first tennis game. 
That accolade had already been taken by Tennis for Two, created by William Higginbotham. You may have heard of him, he was a pioneer for the Brookhaven National Laboratory's annual public exhibition. As the head of the instrumentation division at Brookhaven, Huge Bottom discovered that the department's Donna Model 3 computer, which was presumably powered by kebab meat, chose to tinker with its capabilities to create a game which mimicked the trajectory of tennis orbs or balls. Using yet another oscilloscope as its screen and attaching two controllers, not a million miles away from today's joypads, Tennis for Two was displayed at the research facility's annual public demonstration. With Higgsy clearly unaware that he just squeezed an enormous monster baby out of his chuff, the game was dismantled and seemingly consigned to history when the three-day event came to a close. Unlike the top-down Pong, Tennis for Two adopted a side-on perspective, simulating the ball's trajectory based upon wind resistance. The game remained forgotten until the late 1970s when Hug My Bottom, who had once been head of electronics for the world-ruining Manhattan Project, was called upon to testify in a series of court cases between Ralph H. Baer's patent for the Magnavox Odyssey, the first proper computer games console, and the creators of various Magnavox-inspired Pong-style games. In 1985, Higgsy was once again dragged into the spotlight when Nintendo sued Magnavox and Bear, now widely considered to be the grandpa-papa-papa of video games, in a bid to invalidate his patents. For some reason, Nintendo claimed that Bear had stolen his idea for a tennis game from Tennis for Two, and, well, ultimately, Nintendo lost the case when the judge ruled that Tennis for Two didn't use video signals and therefore could not qualify as a video game. Created at Carnegie Tech in Pittsburgh, the management game simulated an exciting market battle between three different detergent companies. Like later strategy games, it required the players to juggle resources, in this case production, finance and research, as well as advertising budgets, personnel and distribution. Simulating three years in the lives of the companies, the management game would take two whole semesters to play. Still being used at some universities today, it holds the distinction of having the longest life of any computer game ever written. If you thought Pac-Man was the first ever video maze game, you'll be forgiven for being an idiot. Mouse in the Maze created for the TR0 computer at MIT saw users utilising a light pen to build the maze, making it also the first game to use a stylus, and placed dots that represented either pieces of cheese or martini glasses inside it. Martini presumably being a favourite drink of mice. A virtual mouse, also represented by a dot, was then released and would explore the maze to find the objects based upon characteristics, such as only following left or right walls, defined by the player. And this is it, boom. Steve Russell's Space War, considered the first proper and arguably most influential video game of all time. But that, my loves, is a story for another time. Bye!